<laughs> hey, Jen, can you hear me? <laughs> <clears throat> there she is. There's our girl from San Diego. It's early out there, four o'clock. Thanks for logging in. All right, looks like we got about 42 people here. I think we'll have some, give it another minute or so. I did, yes. I think I'm recording. Thank you. All right, awesome. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining me tonight. Um, I am going to get started uh, and try and be respectful of everybody's time tonight. Um, so for all of you who uh, can't stay the whole time or who are logging in uh, later, this will be recorded. And as usual, we will be um, uh, uploading this to our YouTube page and our Integrative Airways uh, page as well. So you can view this later. Um, but let's go ahead and jump right into it. So um, tonight's lecture is called the root cause of tooth grinding. And uh, it's a topic that I'm really excited to speak about. Um, it's something that, you know, we really didn't get too much information when we were in um, dental school uh, about sort of the root cause of really anything. Um, but, you know, tooth grinding in particular, which is something so common that we uh, we dentists see all the time. So I know that there's probably a couple, um, physicians on here, probably some SLPs, some OMTs, but uh, mostly the uh, group typically consists of a lot of us dentists. Uh, so, you know, this is always coming from a dentist point of view. Um, so I spent a considerable part of my career in the dental uh, field, you know, drilling, filling teeth. Uh, and so I've saw a lot of this type of stuff. So I'm excited to share, you know, my knowledge with you and some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that I've been able to experience um, in my clinic and have been able to help people with. Uh, so just as a um, little bit of housekeeping, uh, you guys are always welcome to uh, email me. I've also included tonight my cell phone. Um, so I was told uh, by some other people that I should give out my cell phone so I can stay engaged with you guys a little bit more and you guys can text me questions and things like that. So it also gives me a really good excuse when I'm in, when I'm in clinic and I sort of uh, peel off for a minute. I pick up my phone. My my assistants don't think that I'm uh, texting my friends. I can make a, a good excuse about texting um, uh, other dentists and doctors out there who are looking for help. Um, so for any other questions or to continue the discussion of what we're going to go over tonight, um, please reach out to me and you can also get a copy of my slides if you're interested. Um, so let's kind of get started. So, you know, this is what we, this is why I do what I I do. This is my crew. Um, this is my beautiful family over here on the left. Uh, my wife, Renee, my daughter, Reese, and my son, Bryce. Um, so um, everybody uh, sort of, you know, addressed the, the elephant in the room. The COVID-19 kind of gave everybody, uh, um, gave everybody a chance to sort of refocus on what's important. And so for me in particular, uh, it involved a lot of time with my kids, a lot of time with my wife, a lot of time at home, and uh, sort of helped me recenter and, and really get refocused on uh, sort of my passion and my purpose in life. And uh, these guys are what I, is the reason I do what I do. Each one of these, um, each one of these guys, both my wife, uh, or all three of them, my wife and my daughter and my son, they all have uh, their own airway journey that um, they're embarking on, uh, which is a whole nother topic, a whole nother uh, discussion, not for tonight, but um, these guys are all um, the reason I do what I do. Your screen is not changing on 
a part of the shoot. It's not? No, we're just seeing the initial screen. Really? Yeah, your, like your first slide is here. All right, let me see if I can. How's that? Better? Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, sorry about that. Little glitch here with the um, with the Zoom. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I always joke with people and I say my education uh, started after I graduated from dental school um, and after I graduated from my residency. Um, pretty much 100% of the things that I do today, 100% um, of the things that I do on a daily basis were sort of all things that I learned after dental school. And so dental school gave me that indoctrination uh, gave me some of those letters behind my name, but um, you know, really everything that I do has been uh, in the form of learning uh, through other sort of experts around the world. Um, some really great organizations that I'm a part of. Um, really, the field of uh, craniofacial pain and uh, airway has really evolved uh, significantly over the last 10 years. And you know, I've been practicing for 10, 11 years, so I've been a part of this for a really long time, and I'm very excited to um, you know share with you just a little bit of my knowledge tonight. Um, so a little bit about our center, um, you know, I, uh, I'm the owner, I'm the chief uh, operating uh, clinical director of the pain and sleep therapy center. Uh, we have a fantastic office. Uh, it's really state of the art. It is a really, really, really good team that I get to work with. Um, in the center, you'll see myself, um, my partner, Dr. Joanna Green, who uh, deals with a lot of our tots, a lot of our um, babies, tongue ties, um, uh, growth, our pediatric growth and development. Um, she does ortho, she does expanders. Um, yeah, she's a really uh, a pleasure to work with on a daily basis. Uh, to the right of her is uh, Lauren Reinholdt. She is our myofunctional therapist. Lauren used to be a, a hygienist with me when I was in general practice. And she has sort of uh, seen the evolution of, of me and she has herself evolved. Um, she used to clean teeth for a living and now she helps people uh, swallow correctly. She helps people get um, control of their facial muscles. She helps people with their airway muscles. And so she is our myofunctional therapist. Um, and she gives a lot of lectures on this stuff too. So if you've never seen any of her lectures, um, be sure to look her up. She's a great speaker and uh, a great resource for our office. And then to the left of me is uh, Leah. She's our speech language pathologist. And she really uh, has taken our program to a, a whole nother level when it comes to um, that gap between the babies and sort of the uh, kids that we're used to seeing. And so um, she's a speech language pathologist. She's a lactation consultant. She has been trained um, uh, to be a myofunctional therapist as well. So we're um, really excited to have her and our team just continues to grow. Over here on the right is, uh, you know, my team. And uh, I just get a chance to work with such a great group of people on a daily basis. So we're uh, kind of a small team, but a very impactful team. And, and uh, we're, we're like a little family. So I um, wouldn't be able to do what I do without them. And I uh, just want to say thank you to them because I'm sure a couple of those guys are on the lecture tonight. Um, so at our center, we, uh, I like to say we're an airway focused integrative center for health and wellness. Um, our mission is to provide hope and enhance the quality of life for adults and children by finding the source of their problems finding that root cause, and that is to help improve sleep, increase energy, alleviate pain, and promote proper growth and development. And 100% of our time is spent treating airway-related disorders and craniofacial pain. So we do not pick up the hand pieces in our office. We don't practice any dentistry. We just um, help people breathe. We help people get rid of their pain. We help people grow and develop properly. Um, and so that's what we're all about. Um, some of the services we offer is everything airway from snoring to upper airway resistance to obstructive sleep apnea. Um, I deal with the majority of my patients are TMJ patients, uh, temporomandibular joint uh, dysfunction. Um, I deal with a lot of patients who have primary headaches, uh, ones that can't be figured out by physicians or patients that get tired of medications uh, to treat their headaches and they try and come in and figure out what the root cause of that headache is. And so um, the team and I take uh, great pride in being able to uh, find that out. I uh, get a lot of uh, referrals just for people who can't be figured out. Um, see a lot of patients and I'm their sixth, the seventh, eighth, uh, maybe even their ninth uh, specialist that they've seen and nobody's been able to help them. So um, we see a lot of those patients that kind of come, you know, uh, lack in hope when they walk through the door. And then when we can find their problem and and create a plan to treat it. Uh, it's a it's a very in, impactful thing. Um, obviously, oral restrictions, like I said, tongue and lip ties. We do myofunctional therapy. 
um, pediatric growth and developmental issues, uh, growth of ortho orth appliances and early orthodontics. And I like to summarize that and say, all this has a lot to do with breathing. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Um, so as a sort of selfless uh, plug here, um, please take a minute and subscribe to our channels. Uh, we, we really try hard to put out a lot of content. The girls in the office that are responsible for these social media platforms, they really try and educate the, the, the public, edu educate other providers. Um, we know this is a movement that we're in. We know that this is, you know, not something that's going to be, that's going to happen overnight. And so, you know, with the more we can educate dentists, the more we can educate physicians on sort of the stuff that we're learning and that we're seeing, you know, the faster we can, we can help people and the more sort of collaborative we can be. So we have a Facebook page, we have a YouTube page, we have an Instagram page. Um, and also it's my, my consulting company over here on the right side, Integrative Airways. So um, we've uh, kind of gone public with that as of recent. We offer mentorship in the airway world. We offer uh, continuing education. So this course tonight is being brought to you by Integrative Airways. You guys are all getting CE uh, on behalf of that company. Um, we help people implement airway into their dental practice. And then of course, um, we help a lot of dentists from out of state get their Delaware board exam um, uh, passed and get a license here in Delaware to practice because it's uh, it's tough to get a license here in Delaware. There's a lot of barriers to entry here, and uh, we want to continue to attract good dentists um, here in the state. Um, so why are you here tonight? And that's really a question for yourselves. Uh, I like giving lectures in person. Um, they're way more powerful to me, so I can see all of you guys ask questions. I'm a very uh, interactive uh, presenter, um, but, you know, for the, for the sake of convenience, um, we've sort of turned to this virtual platform, which has really been working out really well for education. So why are you here? Think about it and maybe, um, you know, reach, uh, retouch that at the end of the lecture tonight and see if you learned anything. Um, so I know a lot of you are here because there's been a lot of uh, things in the news regarding uh, tooth grinding and, and breakage of teeth and things like that. I think, um, you know, COVID-19 gave us all an opportunity to sort of uh, refocus and recenter and sort of get in tune with things. I think, one of the things that I've seen is a, a, a complete uptick in uh, amount of house construction, house projects with more people being home, with more people having their home office. I feel like all of us are sort of um, looking at our houses like, hey, why didn't we do improvements in there? So if you guys are looking behind me, we, the wife and I uh, decided to uh, redo our home office. So that's a project that's still uh, in the works. Um, so besides improving our households, I think a lot of patients are now looking at their health. Uh, I mean, it's been um, magnified, I feel like, and more and more people are really trying to, you know, ask the, the good questions that we all should be asking ourselves whenever we have a diagnosis or whenever we feel something. Why? You know, why is this happening? Why um, do I have a diagnosis of high blood pressure? Why am I breaking my teeth? Why am I getting root canals? Why am I seeing all of these um, really negative things happen. So I feel like we're just overall, we're just more in tune with our bodies. And we're, uh, so we're seeing a lot of this stuff um, that's happening. Um, and us dentists are, are here to kind of help and, and here to be, you know, a source of information for our patients who are, uh, have these questions. So, you know, dentists seeing more cracked teeth, what's going on, um, grinding your teeth, uh, your night guard may not be the right fix. So hopefully, um, you know, if, all you dentists are listening out there today. Hopefully you're going to be a little bit less quick to pick up the night guard and prescribe it to your patient. You're going to be a little bit more um, uh, in tune with asking the question of why and doing maybe a more thorough exam on your patients. Um, so let's kind of jump into it. I practice the root cause model. That's just a, a, a line in the sand that I drew uh, a few years back. And I just said, I'm going to just continue to ask why. Um, and, and, and until I can't ask why anymore, I feel like in dental school, we were sort of taught a curriculum and we were kind of told to ask not why we were kind of uh, given information and told how to treat it you know we were mechanics a lot of us are really really good mechanics um, but you know when you really get to the root of things you can um, you can really just start helping people a lot and so i love this little saying open-minded people don't care to be right they care to understand uh, there's never a right or a wrong answer everything is about understanding so when i made that flip in my career um, things root in my eyes started to open up and things really started to change for me so i challenge all of you guys to uh, ask why more um, good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe it or not so i'm going to try not to overload you guys with literature there's so much on this topic there's so much um, literature on um, teeth grinding and jaw pain and airway and stuff like that. I'm going to try and kind of breeze through it with um, hitting the kind of the key points for you guys, but also making this um, entertaining. Um, so 
let's go to the Mayo Clinic because if the Mayo Clinic puts it out, we know that it's true. Um, the Mayo Clinic says that bruxism is a condition in which you grind or gnash or clench your teeth. If you have bruxism, you may unconsciously clench your teeth when you're awake or clench your teeth or grind them when you're asleep. Um, that sleep component is one that we'll be going over a lot tonight. Sleep bruxism is considered a sleep-related movement disorder. This is a medical condition. This is found in the medical books. So it's this, these are not just dental things. These are medical-related uh, disorders that us dentists are treating on a daily basis. Um, people who clench or grind their teeth um, during sleep are more likely to have other sleep disorders such as snoring, uh, pauses in breathing like sleep apnea. Um, mild bruxism may not require treatment. However, in some people, bruxism can be frequent and severe enough to lead to jaw disorders, headaches, damaged teeth, and other problems. We're going to talk about this type of stuff tonight. Um, because you may have sleep bruxism and may be unaware of it until complications develop, right? These are sim until symptoms develop. It is important to know the signs and the symptoms and to seek regular dental care. So, uh, Mayo Clinic. I mean, I, I don't, I don't mind this definition of bruxism. I think it, uh, it opens people's eyes up, and I think a, a lot of misperceptions that are out there is that, you know, grinding is because because of stress. And we're going to look more into this, and I think you guys will be challenging that thought process by the end. Um, so here's what we're used to seeing as dentists. Um, I saw this every single day in my general practice. These are called fractures. These are called crack lines. These are those things that we would take an intraoral image and, you know, we'd walk into the clinic and go, oh my gosh, you know, Betsy, there's a big fracture here in this tooth. You know, we're probably going to have to take out this old filling and put a crown on it. Um, you know, man, are you really stressing out? You're really starting to wear down these teeth a lot. And that's, I, I'm guilty of this because that's what I used to say. I used to blame all these fractures on uh, stress. And um, now that I know kind of uh, more of the root cause of this, I'm, I'm less likely to, you know, get sort of all held up with these fractures. Now there still needs to be dentistry done here, no doubt about it. This, these teeth need treatment, but maybe let's try and prevent some of this stuff from happening in the future. Um, here's some other things that we like, that we we see all the time, right? Nice little uh, vertical uh, vertical fracture there. Who knows if that's in the root or not? that's a, uh, a filling, if that's a core buildup, if that's a, a crown, or is that an extraction? I've seen a ton of those turn into extractions. Um, or maybe we see something that's so, so severe as this, where there's maybe some other comorbidities going on. Um, but uh, this is something that I see in my clinic all the time. And I have to say, more and more of you guys that are local, um, that are on here tonight. You, a lot of your patients are coming to me nowadays and just saying, why, you know, my, uh, my dentist, uh, doctor, whatever told me that you're the guy to see if I want to kind of find the root cause of my grinding. And he said, you know, a night guard's not good enough for me. So we're getting a lot more patients who are, you know, very inquisitive of finding the root cause of these problems. And so, you know, that's what we do. We take pride in this. Um, so as we, as we just talked about, there's a lot of signs and symptoms that we need to understand. So TMJ, uh, headaches, bruxism, sleep apnea, these are all comorbid. These are all related. Um, so we have, you know, things like sleep apnea, um, TMD, headaches, jaw pain, muscle pain, snoring, grinding. Um, we're going to see uh, how all these are so uh, interrelated and, and how the research is, you know, really uh, driving us um, us sort of specialists in this area to really understand this stuff more and, and put out more research, put out more studies so that eventually, I mean, not anytime soon, I'm sure, because, you know, our dental school and medical school curriculums are about 30 to 50 years behind of what's current. But um, eventually, you know, my goal is by the end of my career, I hope this stuff finds its way into a, into a curriculum in the local, in the, in the dental schools. And, and, you know, you know, more dentists are graduating, you know, knowing this stuff and not having to take as many continuing education courses, like what you guys are doing right now, giving up your, you know, Wednesday night to be here with me. So, you know, what we have found throughout the literature is that, you know, TMD, craniofacial pain, airway problems, um, these things are 80% comorbid. We just can't separate them. We just can't separate them anymore. Um, and so what we found with a lot of our patients is, you know, a lot of patients come in for all different various symptoms, all different various uh, reasons. You know, some people come in and they know they have an airway problem. Some people come in and they just have pain. Some people come in and it's that cognitive function. And like, it's this vicious cycle that our patients just sort of are in and they can't break themselves out of it. And they can't kind of um, they they try little things and they still just can't break themselves. And we found that it's really easy to break 
patients out of this functional impairment, this vicious cycle that they're in, when we actually find the root cause of their problems. And then we, we stop treating less peripheral things and we start treating more of the root cause and more of the origin of this stuff. Um, so I like this chart just because it's so simple. Um, one of my uh, mentors in this, uh, in this journey that I've been on for a long time now is uh, Dr. Spencer. Um, I've learned a lot from him and he says, dental sleep medicine is easy as long as you're an expert of the TMJ. So, you know, the, 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 the two are one and the same. We really can't practice dental sleep medicine without practicing or at least knowing um, how to treat TMJ disorders. And so, you know, that's one thing that I pride myself on is, um, you know, being able to fix my patients, whether, you know, they come in with a TMD issue or they come in with an airway issue uh, and being able to sort of um, figure out what's, what's, what's driving the bus and what's, and what's not. Um, so I like that quote a lot. Um, there's a lot of literature. There's a lot, a lot of literature there. I don't want to get sort of, um, I don't want to sort of get uh, buried in, into this stuff, but you know, re reach out to me if you want research on the, on these things. We now know the link here and it, and it's pretty strong. You know, we know that, you know, people that can't breathe are going to be more likely to have um, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. We know that people that can't breathe are more likely to have an upregulation of their nervous system. We know that people that can't breathe are, are more likely to have chronic facial pain. I spent the last weekend at my mentor's office um, in South Bend, Indiana. And, um, it was a bunch of us docs all kind of getting together, talking about chronic pain and talking about how to fix it and uh, learning new techniques, you know, injection techniques and, you know, nerve blocks and, you know, uh, manual therapy, manipulative therapy, osteopathic work. And it's a, sort of a, it's sort of a melting pot of, of physicians. We had a neurologist that was there. We had some osteopaths that were there. We had body workers that were there, dentists that were there, um, OMTs that were there. It was really a special group of people. And, uh, um, I've been very fortunate to learn from a lot of people in my career and continue to learn. I've, I've, I'm, I'm always, um, you know, one to, to tell all of my patients, you know, Hey, I, I don't practice today the way I practiced yesterday. I don't practice, you know, I won't be practicing a year from now, the way I practice today. I'm just constantly learning. We're constantly improving. We're constantly getting better. We're constantly challenging our norms. And without that, you know, we're never going to have progression. And, and this field is too um, dynamic. This field is too evolving to be stagnant in what we do. Um, so, you know, get out there and take some courses. Um, here's the opera cohort study. I mean, this one's really powerful. Again, reach out to me if you guys want these. Um, but you know, all in all, my, my office is geared towards having a system in order to treat both of these things in order to get to the root cause and maximize our patient's outcome. It's really super important um, because if my patients didn't get better, the local dentist would stop referring their patients to me. If my patients didn't get better, all the local physicians would stop referring their patients to me. I wouldn't have a business if I didn't get paid patients better. So it's really, really um, important that we understand and be able to fix these patients. Um, so all TMJ patients are, <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you have um, sort of your own opinions on this. Um, but, you know, a lot of times I like to hear, um, you know, uh, I hear things like all TMJ patients are nuts. And so I like that. And this is another, another little catchy thing that I learned from one of my mentors, Dr. Spencer, um, nuts. And so what does nuts mean to you? Does that mean the patient's crazy? No, it really just means that the patient's really just not understanding their symptoms. They have never had a provider who took the time to understand their symptoms and get to the root cause of that. So, you know, we're so quick to send these TMJ patients out. We're so quick to, um, you know, label them as being crazy or having a, a uh, a psychological uh, uh, problem, and and this is a lot, a lot, a lot of what we do is psychological. But we have to understand the roots of this to be able to understand their symptoms, and that's what's first to be able to help somebody. I mean, a lot of my my new patient consultation is a two and a half hour uh, consultation. Um, so, in order to help these people, you have to understand them. <clears throat> And so we get a lot of patients that are just like this. So that's a lot of the patients that we see. I mean, they just don't feel like anybody's listening to them. They don't feel heard. And, you know, so our office is that place where we, we do listen and, and we want to get to uh, the problems and we spend a lot of time with our patients. Um, so uh, when we talk about uh, TMD and we talk about chronic pain, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of the, the starts of these conversations are revolving around uh, the patient's symptoms. So some of the more common symptoms that we see are clicking and popping of the joint, um, jaw locking, whether that be open or closed. I mean, we always reserve uh, spots in our schedule for uh, patients that are locked. Uh, we always reserve uh, 
uh, um, parts of our schedule for patients that are in uh, a lot of pain. Um, we see a lot of grinding and, grinding and clenching, whether the patient wants to recognize or not. Jessica, I did see your, um, I did see your question. I'm going to answer that at the end, if you don't mind. Um, limited opening, trismus, whether that's from a dental procedure or whether that's from just any sort of muscular spasm. Uh, difficulty chewing, ringing in the ears is probably the most um, probably the most common referral I get from all my ENTs is, you know, Hey, we checked out the ears. Um, it's not, it's not coming from, from there. Um, can you fix that? And, and for the most part, um, it's very predictable. Tinnitus, uh, is, is something that, um, is often very misunderstood. And so if we get to the root of it, we can actually fix that. We have a lot of patients that come in with uh, jaw joint issues and, you know, through our treatment, we're able to help them out with their, with their ringing. And that can be a huge, huge, huge victory in a patient's life. Uh, life. Um, headaches, of course, back, neck pain, other pain and discomfort. So these are just symptoms, um, guys. And we have to understand that they are just symptoms, but what is the actual diagnosis? I mean, we have this umbrella term that we use, you know, so uh, frequently called TMJ. Well, TMJ is a, everybody has TMJ. Like when patients come in and say I have TMJ, I'm like, oh, cool. Me too. Um, that's great. That means that, you know, you have that structure. That's, that's, that's a start without a TMJ. I can't help you. Uh, but it's just become one of these umbrella terms that we just sort of throw everybody into that has facial pain. And um, we have to understand like, what is, what type of TMJ issue is it? Is it an intracapsular disorder? Is it an extracapsular disorder? I mean, a lot of patients that I help, you know, they're muscular disorders, they're inflammatory disorders, there's adhesions that have built up, um, there's myofascial pain, there's trigger points. I mean, and these trigger points are really super important to understand. So if you guys don't have never read the Travel book uh, that goes over trigger points, like realize a lot of the pain that us dentists see in the mouth that may not be coming from a tooth that may be coming from something somewhere else. And so this referred trigger point pain is something we have to root out on a daily basis, you know? So for instance, what my lead assistant, Dana, um, saw, uh, one of our a patient in today, a new patient, and she was complaining of a ton of, um, uh, tooth pain up in the, um, I think it was up in the upper right. And, uh, you know, she starts palpating all the muscles and she's finding all these trigger points in the temporalis. It's like, you know, we don't go right to that. I mean, we want to check out the tooth, make sure there's nothing wrong with it, but we don't go right to that tooth and start, you know, adjusting the tooth or start doing anything with the teeth. Like we want to find out where that's coming from. So of course we lasered the trigger point and voila, the tooth pain went away, like literally chair side. Um, you know, so we have to know where, where, where are the roots of this stuff. We have to know our anatomy. We have to know what we're, what are we treating before we actually treat it? We have to be very careful with being able to sort of give out this night guard um, or adjust a tooth or something like that before we actually understand what's going on. Um, so from a, or maybe it could be an intracapsular disorder. That's a lot of the ones that we see, you know, retrodiscitis, capsulitis, any internal derangements like a disc displacement with or without reduction. You know, sometimes we get to the point where our, our jaw joints are so worn down that there's osteoarthritis, there's degenerative joint disease going on, but we have to understand what the diagnosis is in order to help, help these patients out. Um, Kim, great question. I'm going to answer that at the end too. Um, sorry guys, I'm going to keep rolling through these slides and I'm going to answer all of your questions at the end. If you want to just keep popping them up in the chat box and I will go over them at the end. Um, so, you know, one of the things my mentors taught me is 95% of effective treatment is an accurate diagnosis. You have to have the diagnosis. So how do we arrive at a diagnosis? Well, uh, this is work guys. We have to do, we have to take a comprehensive history. We have to understand the history of the patient. I can't emphasize that any more than, um, being able to sit down and understand sort of how things have progressed. When did this start? What is the onset? How long does it last? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What things have you tried already? We need to understand the history here. And then we need to do a comprehensive evaluation. We can't just sit the patient back, you know, supine and then take out our handpiece and think that we're going to help them. We need to, we need to be able to like, we need to be able to measure range of motion. We need to be able to see if there's clicking and popping. We need to be able to find these jaw joint, these trigger points. Um, so we need to be able to do the comprehensive exam. So here's one of my favorite videos in the world. Do you have a recurring headache, maybe jaw pain, or hear clicking sounds when you take a bite of food? If you do, you may have a disorder called TMJ. And here to fill us in on a possible solution is cosmetic surgeon, Dr. Alex Rivkin, as well as Suzanne. And Suzanne suffers from TMJ. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. Thanks. Thank you. TMJ is an acute or chronic inflammation of your temporal mandibular joint. It's such a common problem. Over 35 million people 
have this condition. Second leading cause of musculoskeletal problems, second to back, secondary to back pain. Yeah, it's of 75% of people in the United States at some point in their lives are going to have symptoms of this syndrome. I want you to take a look, see what goes on with TMJ problems. And for a lot of people, it starts with grinding of the teeth. It's the use of that muscle, that masseter muscle, that has an effect on our jaw joint to cause difficulty opening your mouth, chewing, and pain. So what kind of symptoms were you having, Suzanne? Uh, well, I do a lot of clenching and thrusting in my jaw to breathe because I have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So for me, it just manifests in like throbbing pain right along here. I can't sleep. Sleep. I wake up, uh, you know, completely like I haven't slept at all and intense pain. Like it just radiates from right through this area up right to the temples and right the back of my neck. Everything gets pulled out of whack and it's just... It's a pretty constant. debilitating condition. It's, it's very debilitating. What kind of things did you try to uh, to make yourself feel better? Uh, how long is the show? <laughs> <laughs> I've tried everything from uh, acupuncture, um, antidepressants, chiropractic, where they stick you know, like their fingers in your mouth and pull. Um, I've done night guards with mm -hmm. the dentist. Um, I had my wisdom teeth pulled. I've had my sinuses cleaned out because they thought that might help with the breathing. So a lot of the conventional TMJ treatments right. uh, that we hear so much about. Right. So yeah. Dr. Rifton, we've heard of Botox for wrinkles, <laughs> for sweating. I'm going to stop it there. So if you guys picked up on that, I know a lot of you guys are really smart out there because a lot of you guys are dentists. Um, so if you guys picked up on some of these things, hopefully you've kind of Hopefully you've, you kind of nailed down what I was looking for when I played this video. So this patient had tried a bunch of treatments, right? What did she say? Acupuncture, antidepressants, chiropractic work, night guards, wisdom teeth surgery, sinus surgery. Like she's just searching everywhere to try and fix her TMJ. And now she's on the, the show called The Doctors to do Botox. Um, but did anybody hear what she said? I do a lot of clenching and thrusting of my jaw to breathe because she has sleep apnea. So who's treating the sleep apnea? Who's treating the source of her thrusting? Who's treating the source of her grinding? So uh, like we like to say, the mystery is in the history. That's why you have to sit back. You have to take your loops off. You have to sit chair side and talk to these patients. What's really going on with these patients? Um, not once did I hear them say that she's tried to fix her sleep apnea and that's how she can control it. Um, so moving on, TMD, right? There's there's two main sort of categories. We have you know patients that come in that have macro trauma, and there's patients that come in that have micro trauma. We're not going to talk too much about macro trauma tonight. Um, I have a lot of cool slides on cool cases that I've been able to treat um, at the office. But you know those are these you know blunt force injuries, sports injuries, automobile accidents, uh, falls, you know airbag deployments, things like that that really can can put somebody out of whack. Um, but micro trauma is what we see 95% of our patients. These chronic repetitive movements of the jaw causing clenching and grinding, which eventually wears down the joint. Right. So a lot of people don't really understand the joint. I mean, this is something that I don't even remember learning about this in, in dental school. I mean, I think we got a brief education on this. Yeah. It's the joint that helps the teeth work. Yeah. We have to do CR, CO, MI, all this kind of BS stuff that we learned about the joint. Um, but we really have to take a, we, we have to take a step back when patients come into my clinic, we have to figure out you know, what these structures look like and how this, this jaw joint's working and how to, and how to be able to control this. Um, so I thought it'd be productive to show you guys what a, uh, what a normal joint looks like. And then what some of the joints look like, you know, that I see in my clinic. So that first video up here on the upper left, that's a nice normal joint that is on opening. As you guys remember, the jaw joint is a really, really interesting joint. It's responsible for, uh, not only rotating, but translating, you know, down that articular eminence, having that, that disc in place, um, having it have a, a nice tight capsule so that our jaw movements are controlled. Now we get into sort of some of the other things and you can see here, that's that, that click and that pop. So, you know, at, uh, when I was in general practice, we used to educate a lot of patients on uh, that click and that pop, it's not normal. And as we like to say to all of our patients, yeah, you might be clicking and popping now and you may be asymptomatic, but everything's asymptomatic until it's symptomatic. Um, over here on the top right, we have a medial uh, disc displacement. 
the one that I just showed you before, click and pop, that's anterior disc displacement. Medial disc displacement is when the disc is not only off to the anterior, but to the medial as well, a little bit harder to treat. Um, down here on the lower left, we have uh, a non-reducing disc displacement. These are our patients that show up. They're only opening, you know, 35 millimeters, 25 millimeters at times, you know, that disc is just no longer reducing. And so to be able to understand this joint, you have to really understand orthopedics. Um, and so we spent a lot of time understanding that when I, I got trained in this stuff. And then of course we have our more severe patients, the degenerative ones, and that is that gravel sound that bone on bone, that osteoarthritis. Um, these are patients that, you know, sometimes they come in in extreme pain and, um, you know, we want to prevent this. We don't want our patients to get to this point. And, you know, the earlier we can catch this stuff, the easier it is to treat, you know, some of these degenerative cases. I mean, I'm a non-surgical TM, TMJ specialist, um, but a lot of, um, our patients that wait too long. I mean, these are, these are when we need, um, you know, more surgical, uh, sort of, alternatives. And that's when we have to recruit our oral surgeons to really help out with this. But if we can prevent someone from having, you know, a $75,000 joint replacement, um, man, we really, we really save them a lot of time, energy, and effort. And for all of you guys out there, hopefully not too many oral surgeons on, on this uh, lecture tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's probably not. Um, but, uh, you know, that those joint surgeries are very unsuccessful. I mean, the literature tells us they are not successful, um, at all. So we want to prevent our patients from having to, uh, uh, see the, the oral surgeon have any, um, any surgery in those joints. So like I went over before, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we have to understand where the pain's coming from. You know, teeth pain it might not necessarily be teeth pain. It might be, uh, these trigger points. It might be muscle pain. You know, some, we palpate the whole entire head and neck when our patients come in, you know, we go down the back a little bit. We're really palpating a lot of muscles to get to the sources of this. So understanding these myofascial pain patterns and these nociceptive patterns that sort of, you know, can become centrally, you know, sensitized and, and sort of centrally located within the central nervous system is really so, sort of important. Um, again, I'm going to try and kind of, uh, go through this pretty quickly. Headaches. There's a lot of people that have headaches. We see a lot of these, these patients in our clinic. Um, and so we have to understand what is the headache? What is the diagnosis of a headache? I get a lot of patients that just go, woman today. I, I, doctor said, I have these, um, uh, I have migraine syndrome. I'm like, what, what's migraine syndrome? Like, what, what does that even mean? Like, what's it coming from? Where is it coming from? Where are the circuits getting crossed? What is this type of headache that we have? So it's really important to understand these, these headaches. Is it a primary one, like something that I can treat? Or is it secondary? Is there some sort of pathologic um, uh, pr process going on that we need to get them over to, you know, a neurologist ASAP and potentially, um, you know, find something that could be life-saving? Um, or is it iatrogenic? Is it something that us dentists are causing? Um, I think we'll look more into that in just a second here. This is a little decision-making tree that we use in our office to figure out whether or not we need to refer them right over to the neurologist. I prefer seeing patients that um, have already been evaluated by a neurologist. I prefer patients that have already tried drug therapy. I prefer patients that have already tried other things. That way I can kind of get to the root of it. And um, a lot of these patients with chronic migraines and headaches uh, get uh, immediate relief when I start treating them. Um, but we need to make sure we're sort of um, going through our, our uh, systematic process to determine whether or not they're a good candidate for treatment because um, we can't treat them all. Um, migraine, I, I think this is really, really great. Uh, this is, comes from the Journal of Oral Facial Pain um, in 2010. And we, we now know that migraine is the most prevalent primary headache in individuals with TMD. And so TMD headaches, like let's figure out where it's coming from. You know, my good buddy, Kevin Boyd says, what came first, the chicken or the egg? We need to figure this out, right? Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, migraine is the result of intracranial vascular swelling that results in compression of the A delta and C fibers of the PLA layer that surrounds the blood vessels in the meninges along with, the per along with peripheral inflammation of any of the branches of the trigeminal nerve that results in central sensitization at the nucleus caudalis of the trigeminal spinal tract nucleus. The trigeminal nerve. You guys know what that is, right? That's our nerve as dentists. That is our nerve. I don't want to get much too uh, into this. If you want to study anatomy, come, come spend a day with me at the clinic. Um, we always have doctors coming every week. The team gets mad at me. I'm like, oh, doctor so-and-so is coming, doctor so-and-so. We love having people. We love educating people on this. So um, book your time in our clinic if you haven't already. Um, the trigeminal nerve, that's our nerve, right? We, we, we control that V3 division. And that V3 division is really what a lot of times we find inflamed, that V2 division, the maxillary division, we find these nerves inflamed. These can cause headaches. 
these things can cause um, that this, these can be the root causes of, of a lot of our patients' problems. And so if we understand, you know, neuroanatomy, we can understand and treat this stuff a lot easier, right? Again, I'm not going to go too much into this. The point of these slides are to show you that something as simple as a problem with grinding or clenching, something as simple as a tooth problem, something as simple um, as a, uh, uh, whatever else, a trigger point, something that causes, you know, our brains to become centrally sensitized. Um, we have to, we have to realize these neural pathways and we have to be able to um, sort of be able to uh, fix them and create a treatment plan to identify this stuff. And so um, as you guys can see, you know, studying anatomy is, can be quite daunting. Um, man, studying for the craniofacial uh, pain boards was um, extremely challenging for me because I hadn't had to go through a lot of this stuff in a really long time. Um, but as we remember, um, V2 and V3, they come through the foramen, right? The foramen rotundum and the foramen ovale for the, for the mandibular division. Off of that V2 and that V3, we have that middle meningeal. We have that middle meningeal nerve that actually branches off of V2 and V3 and comes back into the brain to supply what? The meninges. The meninges is that layer, that lining of the entire brain um, where a lot of these headaches are originating. So if we have inflammation of these nerves, we have to understand where it's coming from. So this slide just kind of shows, you know, which we see a lot, and I was talking about it already with the temporalis today, but I mean, we see a lot of patients in our, in our clinic that uh, have jaw pain and they're coming in, hey doc, it's right here. This is the pain, I swear it's coming from here. You know, we're palpating the TMJ, everything looks normal, disc is in the right place, not too much going on. We start palpating all these other things. And actually the source of the pain is just, it's coming from somewhere else. And so, you know, we don't want to start doing things unnecessarily without finding the source of the pain. So a lot of my patients I can help, but a lot of my patients, we kind of just find the root of the problem. And then we send them off to someone who can help. We work with a lot of physical therapists in our daily grind. We work with a lot of osteopaths. We work with a lot of neurologists. We work with a lot of, you know, multidisciplinary collaborative doctors who can help us out with this stuff. Some of my biggest referrals are, um, you know, interventional medicine guys and pain guys and physical therapists that can help out my patients better than I can. So, um, but I like to say that I was the one that started it. So I tell everybody, if they're not sure what's going on with their patients, send them over to me. I'm for sure going to figure out the root of it and get them on their way, whether it's within my office or somebody else's office. So that's central sensitization that I was talking about. That's when we have an overload of, you know, sensory input to the brain to the central nervous system from those A delta and C uh, fibers. Um, and these silent receptors can cause, can cause an increased responsiveness in the central nervous system. That actually can lower the body's threshold for pain. That actually increases that sympathetic upregulation of the nervous system. That actually creates a, you know, allodynia and, and, and all these like terms that we learned about pain that we really never understood. It's like, you know, these patients are coming in very on sympathetic overdrive and they've been, they've been sensitized. And so we have to work backwards. We have to work to find the root of the problem to get them out of this, this vicious cycle, trigeminal neuralgia. I get so many referrals for trigeminal neuralgia of people that just have this umbrella term and they're not understanding what the, what the actual problem is. So I want to give you guys some kind of take homes here. So what's the process, the, the steps to treat this pain? So we always want to, we are dentists. So we always want to rule out uh, tooth pain first. But like I see, and like a lot of my um, colleagues around the country see that do this stuff, is we don't want to just go chasing pain. We, won't, we don't want to be that person that ends up with six root canals and they still have the same issue. We don't want to be that person that I saw um, last week, a really nice older lady who um, had an implant done by one of the local oral surgeons and is in chronic pain. And like, you know, the pain didn't start when the implant went in, but you know, she's looking for answers. And she saw like, just like the lady in the video that you guys saw, she saw everybody, everybody, everybody. And eventually she got the oral surgeon to take the implant out. Um, you know, she paid 5,000 to put it in and 2000 to take it out. I mean, that's $7,000, man, I'd rather spend $7,000 on a lot more things than putting in an implant and taking it out. Um, so she never had a comprehensive exam. And so one of the really great local, local dentists in, um, in uh, uh, sort of Dover, Middletown-ish uh, area where I'm from, sent her up to me and said, hey, I really appreciate you taking a look at this patient. We did a comprehensive exam, found kind of the root cause, and we're already getting this patient feeling better. And now, you know, it's kind of hard to say, yeah, I wish you didn't take that implant out, but, you know, 
I, I wish you didn't take that implant out. That wasn't the problem. Um, and so what if it's not odontogenic? What if it's something else? That's what we need to kind of root out. Is there a pathology going on? Is this a neuro, neurologic uh, problem? Is this muscle pain? Is this myofascial pain? Um, is there a jaw joint problem here? A lot of times people don't realize it's coming from their jaw joint. As many people as we say that we see that show up that say it's my jaw joint. We have a lot of other patients that show up and just say it's this and we actually do locate it to the actual jaw joint. Um, again, we need to figure out when we need, when we can treat and when we need to refer. So remember, 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 take that comprehensive history, take, do a comprehensive exam. And for all of you guys who see these things on a regular basis, reach out to me. I'll send you over my um, acute TMJ pain protocol. It's got some things you can do sort of in the meantime, um, until they can come and see someone like me. Um, yeah, you hopefully, all you guys know of someone like me in your area, wherever you're logging in from tonight, um, that you can get those patients over. The quicker, the better. I can't emphasize that enough. The longer we wait, the more adhesions build up, the harder my job is. The quicker we can get patients over to me, the quicker we can get them fixed. Um, but here's some of the things that you guys can do in your office. Um, but a lot of this is, is stuff that uh, can, is just kind of buying time and sort of eliminating some of um, you know, uh, kind of a uh, process of elimination, eliminating some of these, you know, more acute things. Um, so let's refer to the literature. Again, I'm not going to spend so much time on this, um, but let's, let's go over this stuff. I often, and I'm guilty of this in earlier in my career, should we adjust the teeth? I found that I was doing this a lot more than I should have been. We found that patients were coming in, oh doc, the tooth hurts. You know, it's one thing if the dentist just or the uh, the patient just had a big filling put in and you left the occlusion, you know, two millimeters high. Yeah, of course the patient's going to have a little bit of pain. You need to do a little bit of adjustment. But we, I oftentimes saw patients that would come in with, you know, no iatrogenic things like, hey doc, this tooth hurts. It's like no history. Oh, okay, here, here, let's check your bite. And we just put them in the supine position. We check their bite. Which, by the way, if you're going to be checking people's bites and adjusting their teeth. Make sure you're, you're getting them up, um, sitting upwards. Most patients don't spend the majority of their life like this, laying down in a dental chair. So, you know, in order to be, adjust someone's bite, in order to um, sort of uh, understand it better, you have to sort of, you have to upright that chair. You have to have them bite on the, on the occlusion paper with them sitting upright and not so much downwards when their jaw is back. I mean, if everybody uh, does it right now, you can put your chin all the way down to your chest, See how that bite, bite feels, put your chin all the way up. See how that bite feels, tilt your head to the right side. See how that bite feels, tilt your head to the left side. See how that bite feels. These are all different positions. So, you know, we have to understand that. So should we adjust the teeth? Um, the literature tells us occlusal therapy should be used with caution. The routine emphasis of chronic malocclusions to treat TMD is actually unsupported. Malocclusions may actually be the result of, T of a TMD issue rather than the cause. And so I think that challenges a lot of the things that we learned in dental school. Um, so review the literature and recent studies do not support the etiologic role of occlusion in temporomandibular joint dysfunction. It's not always about the occlusion, guys. Um, I stole this from one of my mentors as well. This is really, really super cool. This is dating back to 1969 when they were evaluating people's bites. I say this to my patients all the time and you wouldn't, but nobody has gotten this right, by the way. Um, nobody, nobody that I've asked. How, and I, I say to my patients all the time, how, how often do you think your teeth should touch? And they're like, oh, a couple hours, you know, all the time. Um, I never have anybody say 1%. And the literature shows us that our, our teeth should really only touch, you know, um, very briefly during meals when we're chewing um, and mostly just when we swallow. And so, you know, we swallow, you know, anywhere from, you know, 300 times a day to a thousand times a day, depending on, you know, what research you look at. But the, the point is we swallow a lot. And so when we swallow, our teeth touch. When we're not swallowing, why are our teeth touching? If our teeth are touching, that's a that's a myofunctional disorder. That's a my that's a, that's a problem that needs to be sent to a myofunctional therapist. We shouldn't be touching our teeth during the day. Normal rest posture, and this is what my myofunctional therapist does every single day. Normal rest posture is lips together, teeth slightly parted, and tongue on the roof of the mouth. That's how you all should be sitting right here right now, unless you're a couple of my buddies that texted me before that saying you're having a couple of beers listening to me me chat. Um, but when you're sitting here at rest you should have normal rest posture. We should not be grinding and clenching on our teeth. Um, so hopefully you guys are, are learning. Equilibration, 
have to postpone equilibration when there's a joint disorder, when there's a, a popping and clipping going on, when there's muscles that hurt when you, when you palpate them, when there's an unstable mandibular position, when there's neuromuscular imbalances, when there's responses from the central nervous system, please don't get out that handpiece and start drilling your patient's precious teeth down. It's not the, it's, you're just crossing your fingers. What, did, what, what, what are you treating? High occlusion? Um, so sorry, I get passionate about this stuff because I oftentimes um, have to be gentle with this when the, when the, when the dentists call. So um, bruxism, what is it? Chronic microtrauma, right? We're talking about those, that microtrauma. We're talking about these chronic repetitive movements of the jaw um, that cause the teeth to hit each other. So what causes this stuff? Well, stress, right? That's sort of the, a lot of the misperception that's out there. And no doubt about it, stress can cause Bruxism, stress can cause grinding and clenching of the teeth, no doubt about it. Um, so we have that psychological, emotional component. We also have a lot of medications. I was discussing this with one of my patients today. She's come so far in therapy. We have her at the point where she's starting to wean from her daytime appliance. Um, and we had to have a really tough conversation with her because she's starting to wear out all the bands of the appliance. And, um, you know, she's on an SSRI and, um, you know, I said, you know, would you be open to talking, you know, having me talk to your physician about this SSRI that you're on, you know, maybe we can get you on an alternative because I know, I know deep down that this SSRI is probably causing more clenching and grinding, you know, so realize these medications and drugs that our patients are on, which are really, really common these days. I mean, a lot of our patients are walking in with anxiety, depression. Again, that's a whole nother lecture. I can go on about that for days. Um, but, uh, you know, we really have to understand what these medications do to our, our patients. And a lot of these side effects are grinding and clenching the teeth. Um, one of the orthodontists locally told me that, uh, you know, kids grind their teeth because of a mixed dentition. Um, I've never seen the research on that, um, but I'm open to it. I'm open-minded as always. Um, pain in the body. This is something we see all the time. The TMJ is the barometer it is the actual barometer for the whole entire body. If we break our ankle and start walking around with a broken ankle, what's the first thing we do? We clench and grind our teeth. Every step we take, we're clenching our teeth together. So we have to be able to treat some of these pain patterns and, and get a patient out of that pain dysfunction in order to help them not brux their teeth, right? And then one of the biggest things that we see, um, and hopefully you guys are starting to make the connections here, is breathing dysfunction, right? Snoring, upper airway resistance, sleep apnea. Um, can anybody name anything more stressful than not being able to breathe at nighttime? I mean, grinding and clenching. I tell them I have patients, I have uh, conversations with my patients every single day about, about this. It's like, I'd rather you grind your teeth. I'd rather you wear down your teeth and stop breathing. You know, that like, that's the better alternative, but we have to understand what the root is. And so when we can control patients' pain, we can, we can control their sympathetic upregulation. When we can control patients' breathing ability, we really can get these jaws quieted down. We really can see less sort of trauma with the teeth and stop chasing things. Um, so what do all these things have in common? Upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system. And so um, again, for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through this. There's plenty of literature, guys. Look up the literature. Sleep bruxism is a sleep-related movement disorder. It's defined as activity characterized by grinding or clenching the teeth during sleep. It has to be distinguished from daytime clenching. You have to distinguish this right? And nobody, your patients aren't going to tell you. Jessica, you were right on when you asked that question. Your patients are not going to know that they're grinding their teeth. You have to educate them. You have to make them aware of the literature that's out there. A lot of patients that I used to see in general practice, I'd say, are you aware of your clenching and grinding issue? No. What are you talking about, doc? Oh, I used to do that back in the day when I was stressed. Hmm, okay. Um, Cause last time you were in, you know, this wasn't as bad. And so you're still clenching. So if, if patients don't know about it, it's probably happening at nighttime when they're sleeping, um, which happens to the majority of people. Um, here's what we do know. This is coming from the current opinion in pulmonary medicine. Guys, I'm taking physician research here. This is, this is in the physician books. We know that stress does not cause bruxism during sleep. Patients don't grind their teeth at nighttime because they're stressed, unless you want to argue for the stress of not breathing, for the, for the stress of having pain in their body. That's the only time patients will brux their teeth. So this is in the literature. And we understand that sleep bruxism, that grinding and clenching that happens when you're sleeping is associated with facial pain and improper breathing. We got to know both of these things, right? So here's some pretty staggering results, right? So here's where we sort of make the connection. Obstructive sleep apnea signs and symptoms precede 
they typically precede the first onset of a TMG, uh, TMJ uh, disorder, right? So patients with obstructive sleep apnea are 3.6 times more likely to suffer from TMD. Children with headaches are 15 times more likely to be suffering for OSA. Hopefully all of you guys who are on here are open-minded. Hopefully all of you guys have taken some airway courses. Maybe you've even taken my airway courses, but we need to start educating ourselves. Us dentists, us hygienists, us people, we are on the front lines for identifying these things before it's too late. Start talking to your patients about obstructive sleep apnea. Start talking to your patients about, about airway problems, right? So again, I like to steal things. I like to take what my mentors are doing and be able to sort of put this on stage. Um, Jameson Spencer, this comes from him. Uh, you know how we were taught to call this parafunction? Well, Jameson Spencer calls this protective function. And what he means by that is protective function. And this is his definition is the physical behavior that is intended to whether conscious or subconscious improve survival guys, what more do we need to improve survival than oxygen, than air, than breathing, right? So protective function could have a breathing component to it. Whereas para function is more of that nail biting, cheek biting, biting on objects, some of these habits that we do, maybe some stress at work, things like that. There's a distinction between para function and protective function. Understand it. More research. I love research. Spent a lot of time looking at research. 1986, Jeff Okeson, he These guys have been talking about this forever. There's an association between airway and parafunction that exists. That that this study actually showed that when people are actually on their back, they have higher levels of of uh, parafunction. What else happens when patients are on their back? Higher levels of sleep apnea. It all makes sense. Collapse of the jaw. Collapse of the tongue. What does your brain do to try and prevent that collapse of your jaw and collapse of your tongue? It recruits the masseter muscle. It, recru it recruits the temporalis. It recruits these muscles to clench and grind your teeth. Understand this stuff, guys. Here's, here's more. This is by Hollowell, right? The masseter muscle we know is activated with any sort of inspiratory resistive loading. That's through the mouth. That's in the back of the throat. That's through the nose. One of my mentors just published a paper that shows an over 90% correlation between nasal valve collapse and grinding of the teeth and, and TMJ dysfunction. So understand if your patients can't breathe through their nose, they're going to clench and grind their teeth. Okay. We have to understand these origins. All right. The masseter muscle can be recruited by ventilatory uh, stimuli. There's so much research. We keep going. If anybody knows the grinding clenching research, G. Levine should be on the, on the, on the forefront of your guys' attention here. He has, he has dedicated his entire career to making the association between sleep bruxism and sleep apnea. Okay. So understand this stuff. Here he is again. Sleep bruxism episodes during sleep are under the influence of brief and transient activity of the brain system, the arousal reticular ascendant system, which by the way, is also a, uh, associated with breathing. If we have a pause in our breathing, that's the system that has to get activated. And that's the system that lights up um, when we study this stuff, when the jaws clench. Coincidence? I think not. This is research, guys. Um, Muscle activity is associated with a rise in respiratory events. With it, It's uh, associated with a rise in arousals. And these arousals are the body's way of sort of getting the patient out of this sleep apnea issue. For those of you who don't understand, the jaw falls back, the tongue falls back. We have a, we have a blockage. We have an obstruction of our breathing, right? Then we recruit these muscles as an arousal. And then we also do some really devastating effects like secreting norepinephrine, epinephrine, and cortisol into our body, which I had to have a really tough chair side conversation today with a patient who has type, type two diabetes, got diagnosed two years ago and is now on four medications for it. And she is in this very, very upregulated um, sympathetic uh, nervous system where she has insomnia. She can't sleep. She's getting light sleep. She's grinding her teeth. And I had to, uh, I had to tell her the reason these medications are not working. The reason your insulin is so uncontrolled is because you're excreting so much cortisol at nighttime. Cortisol will prevent insulin from doing what it's supposed to. We have to understand this here. It is again, nocturnal bruxism. It's a protective mechanism against obstructive sleep apnea. We now know that bruxism is found to be 79% predictive of sleep-related breathing disorders. It doesn't necessarily mean obstructive sleep apnea. It could just mean an upper airway resistance, but we have to be able to understand this. Airway? I'm going to skip that video for the sake of time. I know I'm already over. I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up here soon. I want some real good take-home points, um, but 
as if anybody has ever heard me lecture, I never stay on time. So I apologize. Um, treatment options for bruxism, right? Option one, do we take out our handpiece? Do we start equilibrating? Do we prescribe them a mouth guard or as I like to call it a chew toy? Do we make them, once they grind through that chew toy, do we make them a new chew toy or do we try and find the root cause? Do we try and find the root cause and understand why these patients are doing what they're doing? So occlusal guards, night guards, chew toys, they have, their, they have their purpose, but let's kind of get into this. I use this all the time. I say, you know, my patients go, well, my dentist prescribed me a, um, a night guard. And I said, oh yeah, they gave you a helmet. And they're like, what are you talking about a helmet? I'm like, well, if I were to walk outside right now and I see some guy just slamming his head into the brick wall, am I going to just go to Dick's Sporting Goods and get him a football helmet and say, here, smash away? Uh, or am I going to try and understand what the root cause is of this and be able to help the patient? Maybe I go over to him and say, hey, um, you're really doing some damage here. You mind if we step away and kind of talk about this and kind of figure out what's going on with you? It looks like you're in a state of distress. You know, so those patients that are bruxing and grinding their teeth are in a state of distress. We have to understand it. So, you know, these occlusal splints, they have their, they have their, their purpose. Don't, don't get me wrong. They have their purpose in dentistry. We use them for large implant cases. We use them for large crown and bridge cases. We use them to control some of the investments the patients make with veneers and, you know, things like that. We don't want them ruining the beautiful work that we just did. Um, you know, it's really annoying for us dentists to make a crown and then the patient, um, you know, break it and then we have to make it for free for them. Um, that's not fun. Or if we just did a large implant case or veneer case or something like that. And the patient ruins it. Um, you know, that's on us. Uh, so we have, we, we have use of night guards. Um, but hopefully after tonight, you're going to be a little more hesitant to just give that patient a chew toy. So we know through the literature that dental splints reduce tooth damage and teeth grinding sounds, but they are not recommended for patients with sleep apnea. I'm going to go a step further. They're not recommended for patients with um, airway problems. And, you know, there's a lot more than just obstructive sleep apnea out there. Um, so kind of touched on this. Um, many patients that have sleep apnea will brux. That's that post-event clench and grind of the teeth in order to get them out of their apnea uh, sort of state. Um, so we need to be conscious when we, when we prescribe night guards. Um, and here's something that hopefully should be eye-opening to a lot of you guys. I, if you've ever heard me speak before, you probably have seen these statistics, but I'm guilty of this. I used to make a ton of night guards in my clinic when I was in general practice. And really, I wasn't asking the patients how they slept at nighttime. I wasn't asking the patients how they, how they breathe. I wasn't trying to get any more information on their central nervous system. I was just handing them a piece of plastic and saying, you know, I'll take $750 for that. Um, that's what I was doing. That was what the model that I was taught in dental school. And that was the model that I thought I was doing to help people. Now we realize that night guards are actually not indicated for patients with airway problems. Not only are they not indicated, but they actually can make sleep apnea worse. And that's the scariest thing here is like, we all took that oath when we became dentists, like do no harm. We don't know what we don't know, but some of us are doing more harm than we are good when we give our patients these things. You ever have that patient that goes, hey doc, I just, you, I mean, you made that night guard. I just keep spitting it out. I keep finding it in my bed. I mean, I can't tell you, I'd say at least three patients a week that I see in my clinic um, has that same story. I'm like, well, duh, you can't breathe at nighttime. Your dentist gave you this big night guard to use, which is a piece of plastic that's even more obstructive to your breathing, another threat of, of you breathing, more likely for your tongue to drop to the back of your airway. Of course, of course you're gonna spit it out. I used to do the same thing. I had nasal obstruction. I have a whole nother story on that. It's a whole nother lecture topic. Um, so we've beat the dead horse here. Hopefully I am ingraining this into your head, please be conscious of splints, flat plane splints and obstructive sleep apnea patients. Do not make obstructive sleep apnea patients uh, flat plane splints, okay? So is airway the root cause of all this? Maybe not all of this. If you're uh, Jeff Rouse at the Spear Institute, uh, I joke with Jeff and we, we joke all the time and, we say, and Jeff says, Airway is the root cause of everything. Everything in the world is airway is the root cause of it. And uh, uh, you know, I'm on the, I'm on that train. I'm on the, I'm on board with that. But um, it it seems to be, in my experience, the root cause of a lot of these patients' problems. Uh, so being being an expert at the jaw joint, being an expert at airway, is really going to help uh, help us control the tooth grinding that we see. You know, so who has an airway problem? We're going to run through this real quick. 
Of course, you guys could spot spot him from a mile away, right? AHI for all of you guys who are um, not sort of in this uh, space. AHI stands for apnea hypopnea index. It basically stands for how many times does a break, does a patient suffocate per hour um, for more than ten seconds. Um, so you can spot him, right? He's easy to spot. He's pretty easy to spot. She's not so easy to spot, is she? She has obstructive sleep apnea. She's not so easy to spot, is she? She has obstructive sleep apnea. She is not so easy to spot, is she? She has obstructive sleep apnea. She has obstructive sleep apnea. She has obstructive sleep apnea. That's my mom. My mom has obstructive sleep apnea. That's my dad. My dad has obstructive sleep apnea. And that's me. And I don't have sleep apnea yet, but I was probably on my way if I didn't go on my journey a number of years back. You know, and, and that AHI of 4.2 for me is, um, is scary. I mean, four times an hour, I stopped breathing. Um, that's really, really scary. So I treated myself and I got help. Um, so, you know, I would be classified as your typical upper airway resistant case. Um, don't have a medical diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that I don't need treatment. Um, so again, I'm not going to, you know, harp on this. If you guys want to learn more about airway, sign up for my airway courses. Um, but, you know, these are the easier ones to pick out. Fat old man, right? We kind of, we, we want to, we in the medical space, we want to bucket people, right? We want to, we want to give patients a diagnosis. So I've gotten more medical in my thinking over the years. And, you know, we really have three main classifications of airway problems. We have fat old man, we have young fit female, and then we have our kids, right? And the young fit female are the ones that can go really unnoticed. These are the patients that need the most help but oftentimes go unrecognized. These are the patients that are classified by their symptoms, difficulty falling asleep. We, sometimes we mistake that for insomnia and get these patients on Ambien, Lunesta, melatonin, uh, you know, Tylenol PM, like all these like stupid drugs to be able to treat this thing when we're really not understanding what actually is going on. These are the patients that have more anxiety, depression, more sort of upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system, more fight or flight, right? They have a lot of sleep fragmentation. They have a lot of micro arousals. They're waking up all points of the night grinding their teeth, grinding their jaws. You know, these are the patients that really need the most help. And then of course we have our children and uh, you know, my two kids have their own airway journey, um, which uh, another separate sort of uh, topic, but um, you know, we have to be able to start looking for these things. Maybe some of you guys treat pediatrics, maybe some of you guys don't, but you know, all these things are stuff that we need to start looking for. You know, all the general practices that I work with them um, where um, we do lunch and learns. And so, and if you, and if, if any of you guys are interested, you know, get on our schedule. Um, we'll teach you guys how to screen for this type of stuff. Um, but it's really important that we start having conversations with chair, with, uh, pa with patients chair side, you know, snoring in a kid is not normal. Bedwetting until the age of five is not normal. Breathing with your mouth is not normal. Rolling around and, and, and you know, having sweating episodes at nighttime is not normal. Difficulty waking up in the morning is not normal. You know, um, restless sleep is not normal. We have, to, we have to be able to identify these things, right? Daytime issues, right? Sometimes we see kids that are sleepy during the day. Sometimes we see it go the reverse way. You know, a friend and a colleague, Darius Lugmani out in, out in Chicago, who is a um, pediatric um, uh, sleep specialist, he talks about how ADHD and sleep apnea are, are two in the same. And there's problems with attention. There's problems with hyperactivity. There's problems with focus. And those are the same things that we diagnose our kids with ADHD, yet we never even check the airway. We never even see how they're sleeping. You know, so these, this is a kid. Kids shouldn't be wearing, wearing holes in their teeth like this. That's ridiculous. You see a kid wearing holes in their teeth like this, you send them to a specialist. You know, this is not normal. So what is the role of you guys, the dentists in sleep and breathing? Well, hopefully you guys have seen this. In 2017, the ADA made a clear stance. You know, this is the first time the ADA got involved and they say dentists need to start screening for airway. I hopefully you guys all screen for oral cancer. You guys screen for oral cancer. Take 30 extra seconds and screen for airway. Make it a part of your practice, guys. This is really not hard stuff to do. Make it a part of your, your practice. Your patients will forever, forever, ever be in, indebted to you. They'll forever be loyal, loyal to you. I can remember back in 2014 when I first started screening for airway. And like, I used to have patients, husbands and wives come in to me back in 2014 and say, you saved my husband's life. Without your, your screening of this, we never would have had the diagnosis. We never would have got on CPAP. We never would have gotten the help that, he, that we needed. This is like, you know, serious stuff, guys. And we're at the front line. So 
Um, you know, it only took until 2017 in order to make this a, a sort of a wide known thing. So hopefully you guys aren't late to the ball game, but by showing up for the lecture tonight, you're, you're, you're getting there, right? No way. So we're, uh, maybe some of you guys are a little bit late to the party, but it's never too, it's never too late again, you know, be open-minded, right. You know, be willing to learn. Um, that's a core value of mine is always learning, always challenging what I do. Um, so, you know, bring your hygienist to one of my courses, bring your hygienist to, um, do a lunch and learn with Jen and my, my functional therapist. We will teach you guys how to incorporate this stuff into your practice. It's a couple of little questions on the patient health questionnaire. It's 30 seconds out of your hygienist life to, to screen for this stuff. Uh, come on guys, it's really not that hard. I can give you guys my sleep health questionnaire. Reach out to me, let me know. I'll give you guys these forms. You know, But we ask people, have you ever been told that you snore? We don't say, do you snore? Who knows if they snore? Nobody knows that they snore, they're sleeping. Uh, they've been told that they snore. That's how they know they snore. So be 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 intent intentful with your words. Have you been told that you snore? Does anyone in your family suffer from this? Do you ever get headaches? Did you know that headaches are related to temporomandibular joint dysfunction? Did you know that headaches can be related to tooth grinding? Do you take medications to get to sleep? Is it easy for you to get to sleep and stay asleep? Do you feel rested when you wake up in the morning? Guys, I will teach you this stuff. You can incorporate it into your practice tomorrow. Right? We want to screen for pediatric um, airway issues. We want to, we have five questions we, we give out nowadays. Five, that's it. It's easy, right? And here's our little, here's the latest thing we do. Like a lot of the feedback that we've been getting over the last several years is your guys' stuff is way too comprehensive. Like we need it, we need it, we need a dumbed down version of this. So that's what we did. Lauren and I got together, we created this 30 second hygiene airway exam and we call it we, we're still working on this. I know it's, it's kind of stupid. Just practice together today. Um, JPTT. We got to check the jaws. Is there popping and clicking? Is there limited range of motion? Do you guys know that people should be able to open to 55 millimeters? If people are only open 45 millimeters, 40 millimeters, 35 millimeters, there's a problem. There's a problem. We need to figure that out. Is there pain when they're opening, right? Check the jaws. You guys are all used to putting your hands on these joints, right? Check them. Educate your patients. We have to look at the palate, both the hard palate, the soft palate. Are they narrow? Do they have a high vault? Do they pronounce rugae? What's their malum potty score? What are the, their tonsillar size, right? Is there, do they have a tongue tie? Is their tongue scalloped? Did you guys know this? Scalloped tongues are actually 70% predictive of sleep apnea. 70%. Fissured tongues, coated tongues, the big, deep midline groove in the tongue. We have to check their teeth. Are they, are they grinding their teeth? Are they, are they crowding? Are they, they have enough room to breathe? Um, are they missing teeth? Did the, did the orthodontist who didn't know what they were doing back in the day take out premolars in order to try and fit people's uh, teeth into their head, right? That's, we don't do that anymore. We never take teeth out. No orthodontist should be taking teeth out these days unless the patient says, I hear what you're saying. I don't want to be expanded. I just want you to take my teeth out and make them straight. Okay, cool. We educated you. Um, you know that taking teeth out can cause more problems, but um, at least we educated you. Uh, sign this informed consent. We'll take your teeth out and, and, and you know, collapse your airway even more. Um, snore lab, have your patients download this. If they don't know if they snore, have them download it, right? Uh, and in our clinic, we obviously treat with a lot more than just appliances. We actually get to the root cause. We use physical therapy. We have cold laser therapy in our office. We do injections, um, uh, PRF injections in the jaw joint. We use prolo injections in, in the joint, in the muscles, in the neck, um, everywhere. We do nutrition counseling. We have outside referral partners. I always tell patients, if you send, I always tell dentists that send their patients to me, if you send your patient to me, you can rest assured that if I can't fix them, I'm going to find somebody who can fix them. That is my guarantee. Um, so I use a lot of outside referral partners. Um, and again, remember 95% of effective treatment is an accurate diagnosis. We've gone way over. I'm getting the, uh, I'm getting the, the looks um, from all the people that try and um, try and keep me on time. And um, here's just a little case. Um, she's like one of the coolest pa patients in the world. She's just such a poster child for our whole entire program because you know, she came in with, with jaw pain and that was her chief complaint. Um, and so, you know, this, this patient is uh, clicking and clicking noises were really her chief complaint. She's got headaches. She's got neck pain. She's got fatigue. She's a young, pretty girl. She's in sales and marketing. She talks for a living. She does a lot of communication. And she said, we always ask this, what, why did you come in? What is your victory? She said a victory for her would be able to get rid of her jaw pain and associated head and neck pain as well as fatigue through treatment. Well, guess what? We were able to do that. I'm not going to go through the whole um, 
uh, treatment uh, case here, but we do a review of systems. We take postural photos. We take intraoral photos. We look at the palate. Look how narrow she is. Look, look how high and vaulted that is. That's crazy. Um, and she looks beautiful, right? I mean, she looks like she had good development, right? But now, now, now you guys are going to be looking at these palates. If you see these black triangles here in the corners of the mouth, that typically means that the maxilla is not broad enough. It's not wide enough. Um, so we, we take mandibular ranges of motion, right? Um, we do, we take a CBCT. CBCT is, I use it every single day. I, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without a CBCT uh, in my clinic. And we look at jaw joints and we look at airways and we look at nasal obstructions and we look at spines and we look at um, we look at calcified um, um, uh, stylohyoid ligaments and things like that. So the 3D imaging is extremely important to detecting the root cause. We use radiologists. We use oral maxillofacial radiologists. Listen, I'm, I can't interpret these things the way that these experts can. Um, so we get we we need to get involved. We have a, have a team collaborative approach. And you can see here, Lauren was found to have um, remodeling of her TMJ complexes. Um, that's where posterior position, and it says. Um, uh, which can compress the retrodiscal tissues within the joint. Um, she also has a narrow oral pharyngeal airway space. This may increase the patient's risk for obstructive sleep apnea. How cool is that? We're having a radiologist tell us about that this patient's risk for obstructive sleep apnea is higher. She has ossification over stylohyoid ligaments. There's so much we can find out, guys, by using CBCT these days. We use this every day in my practice. We want to figure out what type of vibrations are coming from the jaw joint. Um, here's CBCT of her airway, obviously very underdeveloped. Um, a lot of you guys probably aren't used to looking at these things, but you know, this is stuff that I look at uh, every single day. And I can, uh, you can trust me when I say that red in the back of her throat, that means that she does not have enough room back there. Uh, we saw a deviated nasal septum. We saw hypertrophic turbinates. Um, we know that challenges to, to having success with oral appliance or nasal obstruction and, and BMI, uh, the more nasal obstruction, the, the, the fatter people are, the harder it is to have success with oral appliances when it comes to sleep apnea. So we have diagnosis. Um, one of the conversations that I had to have with Lauren was, hey, I'm a little bit suspicious that you might have an underlying sleep breathing disorder. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I would like, to, I would like for you to get tested. So we sent her to the um, sleep physician and guess what? Sure enough, we did a home sleep test for her. She came back and she's positive for sleep apnea. She has, she stops breathing seven and a half times per hour. On her back, she stops breathing 11 times per hour. Her oxygen desat to 86%. That's not normal, guys. Our oxygen needs to be above 95%. Okay, so we have a new diagnosis in her treatment plan. We actually found that she has obstructive sleep apnea. I'm not going to go over my treatment plan. I'm going to let Lauren you, take a look at this. Here's cool. Uh, nice little... Um, uh, images of the airway. So that's uh, on the right side is with my appliance in on the left side is without the appliance in. Can you see how much bigger and better her airway is now? Um, and here's the thing. Uh, I know a lot of dentists, dentists are starting to get involved with um, sleep apnea and things like that. Uh, you know, me and my, my team of people, we don't really protrude the jaw too much. We don't put any, any additional stress on the jaw joints. Um, so you can see here, we did, we've done studies on this. Um, my mentor has a few papers out um, in the literature that show that uh, George Gage, um, which, which is pushing the jaw out forward, is actually can be ineffective. And so we use a different type of bite technique at my office um, called the phonetic bite technique. And you can see <clears throat> how much better this airway is. And you can see those teeth are not edge to edge. They're not there. We have to understand how uh, the three-dimensional airway works. And so we use a lot of cold laser therapy um, in my office. Uh, we, we have this thing rotating on a but like clockwork. We are reducing inflammation in our patients. Um, my lead assistant's actually really mad at me right now because my wife just got done with her uh, airway development and she has one of our lasers at home here. And so she's been lasering the heck out of her uh, face, um, helping her heal uh, quicker. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to it. We were able to help her out a ton. We were able to get rid of her sleep apnea. We were able to get rid of her jaw pain, um, but nobody tells it like Lauren does. Um, so I'm going to let her tell you her story. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren and I'm a patient of Dr. Robinson and have gone to the pain and sleep therapy center. I have been seeing Dr. Robinson as my dentist for my whole life. Uh, recently, this past year, Dr. Robinson and I uh, were discussing my TMJ issues a little bit more. I have pretty severe clicking on both sides of my jaw and it's not too painful, but it's definitely something that concerns me and something that we've always kind of had our eye on, um, but that we really wanted to start investigating um, more, you know, this, this previous year. So Dr. Robinson was going to fit me for an oral appliance 
And he thought it would be a good idea if I also took an at-home sleep test um, to see if there was maybe any other issues going on um, besides my TMJ. And I kind of, you know, was hesitant at first, like there's no way that anything else is going on, it was sleep apnea, anything like that. Um, so I took the at-home sleep test. It was super easy. It's super simple to do, um, just like any normal night's sleep. Um, the machine is super easy to use. Um, it doesn't really disrupt you during your sleep, which is really nice. Um, so I took the, took the test. Then we got the results. And to all of our surprise, uh, we found out I did have very slight sleep apnea. So um, in addition to my TMJ issues and the sleep apnea, we um, decided to build me this oral appliance that would help correct both of these issues. Um, so my appliance sets my jaw forward a little bit at night to open that airway to help with my sleep apnea. And it also mm -hmm. takes pressure off of my jaw um, so that I'm not waking up each morning um, you know, in a lot of pain from clenching down um, you know, or feel that additional pain just from sleeping or clenching. Um, so I'm super happy that I went to Dr. Robinson, told him about my issues. Um, although it didn't seem severe at first, we learned that it was a little bit more severe than we thought it was. Um, I also think that you don't really know um, maybe what a bad night's sleep is like until you've had a really good night's sleep. Um, I thought I was, you know, healthy, sleeping fine, sleeping throughout the night. Um, but now with my oral appliance, I really feel like I'm getting a lot um, more quality of a night's sleep too. Um, I feel a lot more rested and happier throughout the day, probably because I'm feeling more rested. Um, so I'm super thankful to Dr. Robinson and his team for helping me out. Um, they're all super friendly. Um, I loved going to the office and talking to everybody. I really felt like everyone truly cared about me, um, you know, what I was feeling, what sometimes I was going through and all of that as well. Um, so I'm only 25. I'm really super happy that I took control of this problem early um, and that things are not going to get, you know, worse for me or deteriorate over time, um, that I'm really taking control of my health and uh, doing what's best for me. So thank you so much, Dr. Robinson and his team. You guys are so awesome. And I appreciate you a lot. Thanks a lot. Cool. So that's from Lauren. Um, obviously, we have a lot of technology at our office. Uh, again, I'm going to wrap this up. Pearls to doing what I do on a daily basis is I got to control patient's inflammation. I got to control their parafunctional, or maybe you guys are going to start using the terminology of protective, um, uh, protective function. We have to control that jaw movement. We have to prevent an airway collapse. We have to restore their proper nasal breathing. And of course we have to get involved with their nutrition and, and talk about a lot of things that these guys are eating um, that cause pain and cause breathing issues. Um, so how early do we start this? Um, Hopefully you guys got a little glimpse of it. I have a great YouTube lecture on, um, I have a great lecture on my YouTube page uh, where you guys can go and earn more CE credits if you enjoyed this one tonight. Um, but I talk of two hours. Um, it's, not, it's not hard for me to talk two hours as you guys can see. Um, I talk two hours on specific pediatric um, issues. And so if you guys are interested in treating uh, the littlest of patients, uh, go on there and you know educate yourself on, um, on what to look for and how to help these guys out. But how early do we start? As soon as there are symptoms. So I don't know about you, but uh, that's a symptom. That's a sign. That's a sign, right? So these are signs that something's going on. Mouth breathing is a symptom that is going to lead to greater issues. So, you know, we want to start early. Here's my little guys back when they were, you know, a little bit younger. Obviously, they're a little bit more grown up now, but we started pretty early with these guys with uh, getting their airways under control. Um, there's my uh, little uh, guy, Bryce, earning his iPad time with his Myobrace appliance. Um, my daughter Reese with her little Mayo munchie there, getting those jaws working, getting her air, airway developed. And there's my son Bryce on the right side there. All Everybody in my household sleeps with tape on their mouth at nighttime. Um, we want to make sure that every single last drop of air is going in through our noses and never through our mouths. You know, breathing through our noses is something that's oftentimes um, really under underutilized and underrecognized, and it's a huge uh, addition to our health when we can breathe through our nose. Um, so we want to we want to we want to do less of the fires. Um, I joke. I was on a um, conference call with a uh, functional medicine doctor um, who was wanted to meet me um, today at lunch, and she said, um, "I told I said I told her I said you know my my goal is to put myself out of business. I mean of course I know that's not going to happen, but if I can start treating patients." Uh, when the snow, when the smoke starts, if I can start treating kids when they're younger, I can prevent a whole lot of the adult issues that I have to take care of uh, nowadays. So, you know, we're really, um, we're really passionate about this stuff. So, you know, so passionate that, um, you know, myself and my mentors, we're on our fourth year here now. And I've been uh, fortunate enough from um, 
that ball guy in the middle, middle there named Dr. Clower. Uh, he is sort of the uh, visionary for all of this stuff. Um, he has asked me to host this year's Pediatric Airway Symposium. Uh, we couldn't be more proud to host this. It's going to be the biggest event uh, of the year for me. I'm going to have the best speakers in the world, Dr. Almost, uh, Dr. Lagmani, Dr. Phelps, Dr. Mariana Evans. Who hasn't heard of Mariana Evans at this point? If you haven't heard of Mariana Evans, shame on you. Dr. Kevin Boyd, Dr. Sarush Zaghi. My goodness, the lineup is just incredible. Um, there he is up there on the upper left-hand corner. So all of you guys who are interested in tongue ties, breathing, pediatrics, I mean, this is a headlining event. Um, so get your tickets now uh, before the prices go up. But this is an event that is going to be taking place in person. Um, hopefully everybody's uh, working towards getting back to the to normal and has had their vaccine or doing whatever they need to do to start, you know, having a human interaction again. But this this event is going to be in person and and, and um, uh, through Zoom as well or through uh, a webcast as well. So get your tickets now. It's, it's going to be something you don't want to miss. A lot of late breaking research um, coming out on this stuff that uh, we're going to present. So I would love to host you. Uh, and so as, you know, another one of uh, these very influential figures in dentistry says, you know, you can only treat what you see and you can only see what you know. So hopefully by um, attending tonight, you guys all know a whole lot more. Um, so uh, I'm really passionate about this stuff. I like to field text messages, emails on a daily basis, as long as I can give my, pa my patients the attention that they need and I can give my family the attention they need reach out to me. I want to be a resource for you guys to start doing more of this stuff. Um, but hopefully your eyes are open. And um, if anybody's emailed me, this is sort of the, the, uh, the quote that I live by, to know even one life as breathe easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Um, and so just breathe. Again, help your patients achieve more than they thought was possible. Um, and at this point, I'd like to take um, some questions. And for all of you guys that stuck around, wow, a ton of you guys stuck around. Holy moly. Thank you guys. That's amazing. I know I went about 30 minutes over, which is typical. Um, but thank you guys so much for sticking around. Um, let me see if I can get on here and answer some questions. How do I find a specialist near me? Um, great question. Um, you got to do some, you got to do, do your own ho homework. So um, depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for someone like me, you probably need to go find someone that is credentialed, like board certified through the American Board of Craniofacial Dental Sleep Medicine. That's probably the one of the board certifications that I'm most proud of that kind of gives me an interdisciplinary look at both uh, pain and airway. If you're just looking for airway providers in your, um, uh, in your town, there's probably a ton of those that are popping up every single day. The American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, um, another one of the boards that I'm involved in, um, uh, is a great way to find a uh, specialist who specialize dentists who specialize in airway. Uh, but these aren't just dentists. There's a lot of ENTs that are getting involved now. There's a lot of uh, physicians that are starting to take more of an active approach here. So you got to do your own homework. If you want to reach out to me individually and kind of give me the area that you're, that you practice in, um, let me know. I can help you find some good credentialed providers that you guys can start working with. Um, what are your thoughts on tonsillectomies, children and adults? Would you recommend a sleep study first? Absolutely. Um, tonsillectomies are typically that tonsillectomies are large tonsils are kind of like worn down teeth, right? So we know that lymphatic tissue like tonsils and adenoids typically grow the more inflammation we have. They typically grow the more sort of improper our breathing can be. So we're really not so quick to just start cutting things out of the airway. Um, we we want to understand what caused it in the first place. So, you know, is it, does the, the kid have a guinea pig that, that sleeps, you know, in, that, that is in the room with the kid sleeping? Does the, is the kid allergic to a cat? Is the kid having dairy consumption? We've seen a lot of great success. When we start working with kids' nutrition, we can actually decrease tonsil and adenoid size quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of our patients get tonsil, tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies, um, but just you got to get some more information first. You know, we got to figure out why, why did they get big in the first place? Um, so that's what you want to ask your patients. Is it detrimental to inhale through the nose while exhaling partly through the mouth while ex exercising? Um, nah, not really. Like we're humans, right? So we're, we're, we're made to be able to compensate. We're made, we're made to be able to adapt. And so, um, I tell people like, you know, get on the treadmill, put it up to 6.5. If you have to start breathing with your mouth at 6.5, that's probably a problem. We need to go see a provider like me who can do a comprehensive examination and figure out why you need to breathe through your mouth. But you know, when we're in the middle of a high intense cardiovascular activity, like I'm a big Peloton guy, 
Um, I ride the Peloton almost every morning. Um, I get, I get into it. I breathe through my mouth. You know, we can, we can afford mouth breathing for an hour or two hours a day. It's the, it's the patients that breathe through their mouth all night long, seven hours of mouth breathing at nighttime. It's the patients that breathe through their mouth during the day. These are the, these are the, the patients that we need to retrain. Um, what does the appliance Lauren use is called and look like Lauren uses a ton of appliances, um, man, she uses a, a ton of different appliances. Uh, we're big on myo brace. We're big on expanders. We're big on trainers. We're big on shoes. There's a lot of different things. Um, and I, I want you guys to understand it's not really about the appliances that we use. It's more about the provider that's behind it. Lauren has such a, a depth of knowledge to the, to the, the, the way that she practices that, you know, she, she has a whole, uh, a tool belt and she pulls pulls out the right tools for the right patients. Um, so don't get stuck on, you know, what we use, um, really challenge to figure out what is appropriate for that particular patient. Um, hopefully that has cleared up some of that. So I hit all the Q and A's in the box there. Let me go over to the chat box. Um, I'm going to work. Um, I'm going to work from front to back. Okay, cool. I think I can get through this. <clears throat> How do you, Jessica, I think left, she had to go. How do you handle a patient um, that says, I don't grind, um, grind or clench yet the evidence is there and you even show them the evidence? Yeah, I mean, listen guys, we can't really get held up. You know, patients, some patients want help and some patients don't want help. This is something I had to learn, learn the hard way in 2014 and 2015, when I started doing this stuff, man, was I so excited to like educate my patients. I was so excited to get back into my general practice and flip the whole entire practice upside down and say, everybody's screening for airway. Now everybody has to screen for airway. Um, and we, we, we really got overboard on it. And, and so if a patient doesn't want your help, um, all you can do is educate them. Hey, you know, I'm seeing evidence here that indicates that you may have a, cr a chronic uh, clenching and grinding issue. You're really starting to wear down your teeth. Um, is that something that you're aware of? And if they say no, say, uh, okay, that's what I thought. That's how most patients are. You're probably doing it when you sleep at nighttime, um, which is very, 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 very common for us to see this type of stuff. You know, would you be willing to, um, would you be willing to sort of hear some more information on that? Maybe we can kind of get that under control and don't be afraid to throw out the finances here. Like crowns cost a shit ton of money. Like this dentistry is expensive. Like, Hey, you're wearing down your mouth. Like, do you want to, or do you want to make large investments in your mouth down the road here? I mean, you're really beating this stuff up. Dentistry is expensive. Um, so why don't we try and fix it? Um, Kimberly asked, can migraine headaches be associated with TMD? I think I have a slide, I had a slide on that for you. Um, so the answer is yes. Mona, what's going on? How are you? I love Mona. She's great. Mona came and spent some time with us at the office. Um, Pat says, I have a patient that sleeps on their side and place pressure on the TMGs and TMJs. <clears throat> Sleeping on the back has improved that discomfort. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, sleeping on the back is the correct way to sleep. Um, orthopedically, um, we should be sleeping on our backs. Problem is, is uh, like we like to tell our patients, breathing trumps everything. So if we have a TMJ issue um, and, and we can kind of alleviate that um, by, by different sleeping positions, uh, great, but a lot of a lot of patients can't sleep on their back. A lot of patients have to sleep on their side or their stomach because they can't breathe on their back. Um, so great, if that works for your patients, that's fantastic. I don't think you're getting to the root cause of the TMJ issue, but um, hey, you know sometimes little little things go a long way. Um, how do you feel about orthodontics expanding and bringing the jaw forward to get that tongue tie out of the throat? I love it. Love orthodontics. Love, 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 love expansion. Love orthodontics. Many of my referrals go right to Dr. Evans. She's the expert at this uh, growth and development thing at um, orthodontics. Um, Dr. Green in my office is fantastic. She has a very advanced education on this. She does a lot of growth appliances. Both of my kids are in growth appliances right now that are we're expanding their jaws. Um, my wife went through expansion as an adult. My wife, as a 35-year-old, actually had her jaws expanded very successfully. And, and boy, if you ever um, get a chance to talk with her, my wife's story is really, really cool. Um, Kendra says, FYI, patient myself, tonight's sleep study because I do not snore. I'm not overweight. I have huge tori upper and lip, 
huge tori both upper and lower yeah kendra i mean um go go find somebody who will get a sleep study for you there's people out there like me who will do sleep studies for people like you um at some point in the next 20 years sleep studies are going to become like blood work like we're all going to we're all going to get sleep studies on a routine basis i've had about four or five of them in my life and i'll get one every single year to the day i die because i want to i want to get an update what's going on when i'm sleeping um, and i want to be able to be proactive um is grinding in children only related to sleep disorders no i don't think so i think it's a large part of it um but you know it's it's often misunderstood. There, there's a lot of other issues that can be going on with, um, with kids, but, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of sympathetic upregulation. I mean, our kids are eating so many processed foods these days. I mean, our kids are eating a lot of dairy, a lot of uh, glutens and things like that. I mean, um, you know, that all that causes upregulation in the sympathetic nervous system. A lot of child, a lot of children are in bad homes. Um, and that might be causing stress. Uh, so no, it's not always the case, but I mean, rule that out before you start putting a kid on medication. I guess that's, that's my point here is don't put a kid on a stimulant when stimulation is the problem. You don't want to put a kid on ADHD, ADHD medication when actually their sympathetic nervous system is what needs to be downregulated. You need to get more of a parasympathetic going on. Um, hopefully that helped. How do you make money running a TMD clinic? <laughs> uh, it's not a TMD clinic. We find the root cause of the patient's problem. So we're fee for service. Um, uh, we offer uh, permanent solutions. Uh, typically, Matt, most of my patients only see me for about three or four months. I check in with them every year, but most of the, the active treatment plans I do are three or four months. You know, so we, we charge a, a fee up front to get started with therapy. That's how we make money. Um, no, is this as lucrative as dentistry is? Eh, probably not. I probably made a lot more money doing dentistry, but it just wasn't my passion. Um, you know, being able to help some with somebody's pain issues and somebody's um, breathing issues is, uh, is really a lot, a, a lot more powerful than being able to, you know, fix somebody's smile. Um, that's just me. Uh, I don't know. Um, my ortho associate told me that AAO really recommends ortho to stay away from treating sleep apnea. Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, um, um, ortho, the orthodontic literature is there, but it probably won't be white papered for another few years. Um, again, everything that these big, huge organizations have to kind of um, put out there, it, these are guidelines that a lot of orthodontists like really I mean, it's the literature. Changing literature takes a lot of time. It takes many years of people like me and Dr. Evans and the Phelpses of the world and the Lipskisses of the world, the Clowers of the world, the Zoggies of the world. Like we're all, we're gathering more information, you know, to be able to present to these, um, these uh, big organizations so that they can finally adopt this. So don't expect it anytime soon. Actually, I was at the AAO in 2019. Um, and that was uh, the first time that the American Academy of Orthodontic, uh, Orthodontists actually even talked about airway. So we're getting there, guys. We're making so much progress. There's a lot of things to be thankful for. Don't get stuck up with the fact that AAO doesn't um, recommend ortho to get it in involved with, with, um, with sleep apnea. If you're an orthodontist and you're not comfortable treating it, that's okay. That's, that's completely fine. Orthodontists were sort of taught how to straighten teeth and how to put people's bites together. They weren't taught how to, how to, how to treat sleep apnea. So don't, uh, you know, you need advanced training. Like, you know, go, go learn from Dr. Evans, go learn, learn from Mariana, go learn from, you know, Eric Phelps. Um, these guys are, are great educators. So if you're not comfortable doing it, refer it, you know, I'm, I'm completely fine with, um, these uh, big associations sort of not recognizing this yet, um, but we're making a lot of great progress. It is, it is, it's come a long way, guys. Um, we're really doing, really doing uh, well. Um, so I think I answered everybody's uh, question for any of you SLPs that are on here tonight, any of you OMTs that are on here, here tonight. Um, we, uh, we have an open position at the Pain and Sleep Therapy Center. We are looking for a, a speech language pathologist who specifically, um, wants to work with the littlest of patients, those, uh, you know, those two, three, four, five, uh, six years old, we're looking for an SLP who's willing to be trained in myofunctional therapy. So if that interests you, or if you know of anybody local that, uh, that interests them, uh, tell them to reach out to me. Uh, I think this was great tonight, guys. You guys have my cell phone. You guys have my email. Don't be strangers. Um, hopefully this was just the start of some really important um, information, education that's out there. Um, thank you guys all so much. I do all of this 
you know, not just for my family and for my patients, but for you guys. Um, thank you guys all for the support. Um, if there's any other topics you want to see covered, if you want to, if you want us to do another myo lecture or another pediatric lecture or a specific TMJ lecture or how to bring airway into your practice, reach out, you know, let me and Jen know, you know, we, we, we make these lectures for you guys. Um, so, um, yeah, we're here for you. I hope you guys all had a, uh, have cell phone slide, not showing here. Let me, um, There it is. Contact me anytime. There's my cell phone. 302-547-2982. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Everybody have a good night and uh, screen your patients tomorrow. All right. See you guys. Yes. CE credit is available. Email Jen. Email Jen.